And he didn't want you to put that burden on you. But kind of goes back to what the gentleman said a few minutes ago, is that he carried that load for many years for me. So why should I carry that load for him? Mm-hmm. But knowing how he, but he went through the Great Depression. He was born in 1923. Mm-hmm. He was nine, 10 years old during the Great Depression. So if they knew what it meant to struggle. So I say all that to say, that was my father figure. He meant the world to me. He, when I go home now, he's buried in uh, the Veterans Cemetery in Houston. K954 is his burial <laughs> ground. Yes, sir. I go there. You know, I can't. Every time I go there, I just break down because how much I love that person. How yeah. much he means to me, how much he meant to me. How much, every day of my life, I'm walk. Even with my son now, I tell him some of the things my grandfather told me. He said, yes. I know you're looking at me. I remember my grandfather used to tell me sometimes, he said, I know you're looking at me. Like that old man don't know what he's talking about. Just keep living, son. One day mm-hmm. you will see. And so now when I, when I hear myself saying some of the stuff he said to me, I just chuckle sometimes because it's important. But the one point I do want to make real quick is it's amazing how when I hear these different stories, and me and my buddies in the military have stories. The reason we don't know each other's story because we don't tell them. That's it. We so we so much to ourselves mm-hmm. because we're so afraid that someone that's gonna belittle me, degrade me, or, or show or put me in a place where I have to defend myself. Mm-hmm. And there was a point in our lives where that was the case. But I got two buddies of mine. I've been knowing these been known these guys since June of 1989 and we talk about everything yeah when I say everything I mean every single thing we talk about things that only you talk to about your closest 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 friend and they, that's how they are to me so mm. but when it comes to my father my grandfather he made me who I am today and, and like I said we'll talk more about it later but I always try to look out for my family and make sure Absolutely. my family know if they ask me for something, I'll figure it out. Absolutely. That's how my, that's how my grandfather did for me. Facts. I, still remember, I still remember when I wanted a swing bike. It was $210. And uh, my, my grandmother at the time looked at me, well, we can't afford no $210 bike. My grandfather looked at me and said, I guess you got to be working hard this summer. If that was what you want. <laughs> yes, so, sir. So I say that because I think that is what we all have in common. We all have various, and here's one thing I will say this here about fatherhood. So I remember 19, it was seven, September two, 1987, I was over in you know, Australia. Mm-hmm. And I called back home, my sister, and I was complaining about something. And my sister said, I was complaining about not knowing my dad. My sister told me, son, he said, boy, stop complaining. You know your father in heaven, and he knows you. And ever since that day, that stuck with me in my mind. I have a father. He's mm-hmm. in heaven. And when I go through tough times and dark moments, I get on my knees and pray to him. And I know wherever I'm at, he's there with me. Mm-hmm. When I went to combat, when I went to, when I went through a lot of things in my life, when no one else could be there with me, he was there with me. So I tell Absolutely. all you brothers, man. At the end of the day, we all have a father. He's in heaven. Yes, that's and it. As long as you believe in him and trust in him, he'll see you through all his madness in life. Oh, so, man, that's incredible, man. Harry, I just got to say this to you, Wayne. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know about that, baby. <laughs> Simple five, brother. <laughs> yeah, Lem Bravo, baby. See y'all. Oh, oh man, when we pound, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, sir, man. I can't wait to tie all this together, man. It's so many, oh, so many things of us, all of us, the six of us being tied. So now I want to drop to the bottom and I, and I'm, I want you, like I said, I want you to clearly articulate. Now we want to go to the, um, we call him the newcomer on the squad. He the big, he the big 10 newcomer of the year. Um, it's cool to be putting up 24 and, and five assists and two steals every game, but it's different when you don't have a father in your life. Right. And one of the things um, I picked this young man, because first of all, he's an incredible young man. Uh, he's not your average 14 year old. Um, he's going to do some great things and he's already begun to do some great things. But one of the things when he and I began to talk, we had a similar story as related 
to our fathers and then as it relates to our grandfathers. So Bailey, I want you to, to chime in and share a little bit about um, the story with your dad and your grandfather. I think it's going to bless a lot of men, especially our generation, to hear it come from your perspective. Okay, well, um, the earliest memory I have of my father, uh, I was around five or six. Uh, it was it was super late at the, in the middle of the night, and I just woke up to my mom and my dad arguing. And um, my, my mother told me to go into the closet. I didn't go into the closet, and my dad was literally threatening me and my mother with uh, a knife or, or something. And, I didn't know he had the knife and I, I was really confused, but eventually I went into the closet and I ended up falling asleep. Uh, but he had, had ended up going to uh, the police had come and picked him up that night. My mom had called the police on him. So like, that's the sort of the first memory I've had of my, of my father. And um, they got divorced after that. And after that, um, it was just, you know, I would go with them every other weekend and it, it, it was pretty cool. I, I always enjoyed being with my father. Um, we went to the park a lot and we played football. And it, it was fun. But sometimes during those times, he would do things that were just really horrible to my mother and the way he would treat her. And then um, also the situations he would put me in. Uh, and when I was put in those situations, like he, and I told him that I didn't like he, but he really didn't care. Um, and then I believe I was uh, first, second grade. Uh, it was a situation involving a gun. And I had told my mother about it and my father didn't seem to care. And I was like, I didn't, I was too scared to go back with him. I didn't even want to go with him anymore. And um, I haven't seen my father since, but um, just just recently, uh, maybe a couple months ago, I, I asked my mother if I could talk to my father and and like to see if I could sort of build a relationship with him again. And uh, she was a little hesitant at first, but she, you know, that she, she knew that's what I wanted. So I tried and he said um, he didn't want to have a relationship with me. Um, and he didn't want to talk to me or have a father or son type of relationship. And uh, I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't really hurt by it. I mean, uh, I had already gotten over what had happened between like the ages of five and nine years old. I've already gotten over that. And to be honest, it was just to see like maybe if we could still have that type of relationship because I've, I already have so many father figures in my life. But uh, I just feel like it's a little bit different when you're with your actual father, but uh, he didn't want to have a relationship. And I mean, I was cool with it and I respected it. I mean, I don't I don't really mind anymore, but um, I have so many people, my uncles, mentors, uh, people that my mother has met and has, you know, they have all just helped me. And um inspired me, motivated me, can just told me to keep pushing and doing just keep doing what I'm doing. Uh my grandfather was yeah. definitely one of the first. Actually no, he was the first. Yeah. And um it was it was only a couple of days, I think maybe a couple of days, a couple of weeks after that incident where my um that that night with my father, like he had the knife. And uh him and my mother were talking. And um, he didn't want me growing up and being that angry kid that didn't, that angry black kid who didn't have a father and was just, he was just ended up being a bad person. So he would write letters to me instead of just calling me, he would write letters. Yeah. And that was his way to get me to um, express myself and just uh, talk to somebody about how I felt. Um, it, it went on for a while and eventually I just, I started writing by myself. It was just something I picked up and something that I enjoyed. Uh, like, sort of like a, my own therapy, um, very therapeutic. And I would just write for myself, whatever I was thinking of. And um, um, my, my grandfather has passed away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, and um, I've actually never met, I don't think I've ever met him in person, but 
even I mean, just it, that doesn't really matter. He still made a huge impact on my yes, life. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Yeah, I, yeah. Man, incredible! I cannot wait to come back to tie this in. Um, like these conversations need to be had. I know for me, one of the big things where it just feels like you're the only one. Like, or people may have it bad, but they don't have it bad like I have it bad. I promise you. There are thousands of young Baileys out there. There are thousands of Stevens, thousands of Waynes, thousands of Keiths that are out, thousands of Harris that are out there. Now, what I love about the balance of this podcast is we've just heard um, five different examples of the father not being there. We we all we have to have an example of what it's like to have a father at home. So, to Ron. Um, is actually my family. We are related. Um, I've been knowing Teron a long time, know his family for a long time. And Teron, I've told Teron this privately. Um, you know, I think the world of his dad, um, Teron um, has two other brothers and a sister. And I watched his dad up close with um, his sons and his daughter. And, you know, um, man, Mike was the ultimate dad to me. But like, again, once again, it's my perspective. So I don't want to chime in on it. I want to run to talk to us about his relationship with his father, um, his relationship with his siblings, you know, how they view their father, the impact that he had. And just how is it now that he's a community leader, um, he's a community advocate, he works in the school district and he's responsible for for building young men. How does the reflection of your father play into that and what impact did it have on the things that you do now? Um, and so, yes, I uh, appreciate your, your guys' stories. Um, as for my father, he was present. He um, actually left us um, in November um, of, yeah. this, of, of last year. And so it's coming up on a year. Really? And, uh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, man. it's coming up on a year. That time is up. moving, man. Yes, sir. It doesn't slow wow. down. But the impact um, on me and my family is he's he was truly influential. Um, I'm a football coach. I'm a teacher. And um, every year as a staff, though, we do like a uh, bonding um, experience before we start two a days in camp and school starts. And we always talk about the most influential person in your life and why. And, um, and I always give kudos to my mother um, before, and then I always shift to my father. And mm -hmm. it's because of, you know, who we made me um, and our family. You know, we we are a family of educators and, and coaches. And, Absolutely. Um, and he's the one that installed and introduced us to sports, um, along with other things, of course. And, um, and so he was just a vital part of our family. Um, and just the impact that he made on, on our lives and, and a lot of people's lives was tremendous. Um, he just, he developed my personality um, as a young man um, growing up. We all have our faults and nobody's perfect. And so when you're growing up and they, they, they whoop you or they discipline you however they do, thump you on the head or whatever, you know, you, as a kid, you're thinking, I'm never going to grow up to be that mean, or I'm never going to grow up and act like that guy. I'm going to be this much better and that much better. And, and 20, 30 years later, you end up doing the same stuff that he was doing. And, and you realize <laughs> how much yeah. of the same you are. Um, and so, you know, I, I heard some generational curses, some generational things yes, um, and yes. other people's stories that, you know, just pa that are passed along from generation to generation. But yes. there are also some generational blessings that you have. And so, Absolutely. Um, I think he installed some blessings and some generational things in a positive light for us. Um, one thing that I will say about Wayne's story, um, I believe it was directed towards his grandfather. And that reminded me of my dad on how I was able to cope over this last year, man, as a uh, father's or the person that you... Um, identify as that guardian, whether it's your grandfather or a neighbor or, or whoever, a coach, teacher, mm -hmm. uh, they do protect. And mine was a protector for sure. And, and obviously they protect and they, they um, take care of you financially and physically. But, um, and I understood that, but really I didn't realize how much they protect me like emotionally 
and and protected my peace. Mm. And um and, and Wayne's story kind of reminded me of that because it's like, why didn't I know you needed to do this? Um, why couldn't you why didn't you let me help you out? And and um the uh, during the time where he was in the hospital a lot, you know, I was like, why didn't why wasn't my last speech with him and my last talk with him? That's okay. It froze quickly. Hit Not about foot. football. Why was, there we go. You got me. That's no, we good. Um, woulda, coulda, shoulda. And um, I got you. See, my internet is a little bit unstable. Oh, you good. You good. It's all good. You catch me. We're catching it. Keep going, T. But, um, but what I, good. And so, but what I will say though is I learned that um, they protect your peace. And sometimes, as long as they know that you're happy, as long as they know that you're happy, they're good. And so they're not going to put those burdens on you. They're not going to put right. those things that, you know, make you worry and stop what you have going on. And um, that's what I got from this story. And that's what I learned from myself. Um, and it gave me a little bit of peace. And um, so I just wanted to share that. Powerful, man. Powerful. All of everything that you guys shared are powerful. So for a pen here uh, for fatherhood, it, and anybody that wants to chime in after that, please do. But I want to put the pin in. So those that are watching, you could identify with our stories in some type of way or another. This is what I want to show you. When you, when the thing, when the thing digs in you the way it does, I'm going to tell you, me, man, when I'm in pain, I am looking for relief. And I know, man, there are men, there are men generation when i say generations talk generations of men are looking they're looking for relief now depending on what your example is depending on what you saw what you've been taught we all get relief in a different way right my my definition of relief is relief should lead to me being better feeling better and the end result should have an impact on others right now the others that would beg to differ and that's cool i don't i don't it's it's that's just my definition of it but I will say this, um, I can look at all of you men. When I look at Steve, his work over the last 35 years, when you hear his story with his father, I look at the, his heart. I look at his passion, not just for a city, but for a generation of men and young men, his work with prison, his work with juveniles, his work in community, um, his work in building bridges. It stems from the relationship with his father. When you look at Wayne, um, not knowing who his father was, I'm telling you, you are looking at, if you look up the dictionary of a family man, he's sitting on the podcast. Ain't nothing that our family could need want. He steps up to the plate. I'm talking about across the board. I've always admired that about him. I've stole things from him and put my twist on it, but I've got it from him. I'm telling you, you got to have these people in your lives. Same thing with Keith. I would not have never known the extent of his relationship with his father, but he is the ultimate family man. I'm telling you, those deficits, it causes a pain that you're like, man, I don't want this in my life. And man, I, we, we talk about a lot of stuff, but the number one thing here, and I talk about his family, it's the number one thing that we talk about. When I look at, when I listen to Bailey, what he shared, the impact of that, the young man that he is now. Now, now come on, guys, y'all got to chime in on this. Bailey, don't say anything. When you look at Bailey, and those of you that have met him and been around him, no way possible, because you know that's been this young man's story when you've been in his presence. Come on. Keith been around him. Steve, you've been around him. Come on, y'all talk, talk to me. When you look at him, no way you know that's his story. No way. I, I'll, I'll chime in on that one. Uh, Go ahead. You're, you're right. When when you look from the outside, looking in, the times that I've been around him, in my mind, I would have said he came from a Cosby-type family. Yes, sir. A mother and a father. Yes. That was extremely stable that, that you know, inspired him to be where he is. Um, but I, what, what I will say about it is I think it gives kudos to the importance of the role that people outside of that figure, when we are missing a part, let's say a father figure, the role that others play and the impact that it can have in your life if you allow it to. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the key is 
when you allow those relationships to heal you and to um, fill those voids that we have, it yeah. can have a positive relationship or a positive outcome on your life. But you just have to allow that to happen. Right. And too often, I don't think we recognize those and give kudos to those people who do fill those voids because um, somebody oh. has to. Fill them. Somebody has to. Yeah. It, it, let me chime in on that. Is is so much truth to it takes a village to raise. Yeah. I see truth in that when I see him. Yeah. I see truth in that in my own life. Right. I still remember everybody that lived in the culture sack that I grew up in. And there are times in these last couple of years, I've gone by there just to see if they still live in it. And those who I did find that was, man, I just start crying and just say, thank you. Thank you for what you did in my life when I was staying in this neighborhood. And Bailey, man, I just want to commend you, brother. You yeah, have, man. man, you are beyond most 14. You are beyond most 30 year old men that I know <laughs> yeah. that ain't, you know, yeah. you know, using it, the playing the blame game. You took it, it suggested me that yeah. you took it and use it as fuel to motivate you to keep moving forward. Yes, sir. And man, what I've seen from you, the times I've been with you. Yeah. And you, yeah. you, you own a trajectory of total success. Yeah. It's going to be some bumps along the way, baby, but I think sure. you've got a good chance for of sure. being a great father, a great husband when it, that time does come, and a community impacker. Yeah. Game changer. Man, because yeah. you, well, 14 year old man ain't thinking like that. Absolutely. And they would look at that situ that kind of situation and usually say, oh, man, I'm going on. Yeah, and that's the reason why most of our folk in the penitentiary now, a lot of it stem back from their childhood. Yeah. What's powerful about what you said, Steve, I, I gave him the invite. Obviously, I, I see the potential. I know the potential. Now, um, when he got the invite, like his excitement to be on with us, I will tell you, <laughs> when I was his age, my grandfather said, hey, man, we finna have this round table on the patio. I want you to come talk. I'm telling you now. I'm like, mama, you got to come rescue me. I ain't trying to go over there and talk with those guys. I ain't trying to be with them. Like, it ain't even no type of identity. So the fact that he's just, he wants to be on here. He he feels he has something to give and he has something to share. I, I want some mom, some single mom, listen to me. Bailey's mom, she's doing it. She's not on now, but we're going to meet her at the end. Single mom, I, I promise you, it's it's hard. It is, I promise you, it's hard. But you got to roll up your work and put it in the work. Or if or if you're a single dad, maybe it's hard, but you got to look. Life is hard. You got to live it hard. Roll up your sleeves and put in the work. This is a living example of that. I don't want to go out too far. Wayne, give us some commentary on that. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Bailey. <clears throat> Knowing I, I hear it in your voice, I hear it in your heart, and your spirit, that there's somebody God going to put in your life that's going to help you through this situation. Mm -hmm. You may not have put him there yet, but he may be there ready, but he will get you through it. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. Because one thing I truly believe that things in my teens, my 20s, my 30s, my 40s, That's it. even my 50, I look back at and wonder why I did it. I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So just trust me. With God, just stay on your knees and pray. And I'm not the most spiritual person. But I know, cause I know. Hey, I I got my dirt in my pocket. I, right. I got. I got to tell people I retired in two thousand three from trying to do dirt, but I still do it. However, so just trust me. I tell you, just stay on your knees, continue to pray. Right. Like in your voice, in your heart, man, it's, it's hurting you. But God gonna put somebody to take that pain away. Right. And help you get through that pain. So hang in right. there, brother. Absolutely. Now, Teron, I want you to close this part out, Teron. Um, obviously, um, as it relates to the whole father part, um, man, such a you know a blessing, man. We, I promise you, you know, just some of the things you were saying it was like, man, it's been so cool to have that growing up or have that in our lives. But what I also um, what I also know, and I, I want you to give Claire. I know bits and pieces. Um, I'm going to ask you these questions, and if you can answer them, I believe you, excuse me, I believe you can, I want you to do it. So was your, was your father's father in his life? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You see where I'm going with this, guys? Mm -hmm. Mm. So, like, somebody, like, somebody has to jumpstart it, right? Now, Tehran's dad's dad was in his life, right? Now, let's see, it's five others of us on here. Now, we could, we could, um, we could take the, the, the notion or we could take the, the position in life that, hey, man, this is a hand I've been dealt. I got to play this hand. But if you know anything about spades, you know, it's just, listen, a hand. And we know in life there are multiple hands that you're going to get. So what happens is we get this one hand and we think this is the only hand that I'm ever going to get. And it's not true. This is just the hand you got through your teen years. In your 20s and your 30s, there's a different hand. And what happens is we're either afraid to play this hand and because this hand was so traumatic, it's like, I don't want another. Don't deal me another hand because I can't, I can't handle going through another decade of this stuff. But you all know, even Bailey, who hadn't even lived half as long as us, life is about seasons and changes, man. I'm telling you, I, I, and I'm going to keep saying it. What I'm doing right now, if you'd have asked me 20 years later, ain't no way I'm going to be on with some guys talking about life and strategy. I, I'm not doing that. That's not for me. But because life gives you a different hand, right? And so um, wherever you are, whatever the state is, I, I want you to know there's hope for you. So I want to, I'm going to make this statement and we're going to transition into brotherhood because you guys have, this is a part that I want to tie some things in with you guys. Um, I always talk about, I believe every man or young man should have three relationships in his life. First relationship, you should have somebody that's um, that you look up to. And when I say look up to, meaning they have achieved some things in life and then they are doing some things in life that you want to do. So the relationship is a relationship that can pull you up. It makes you better. When you're around them, you learn. I, I say this all the time. I love being in a relationship where I'm made to feel dumb. In other words, I'm learning some things. I love those relationships, right? I believe every man needs that type of relationship. The second relationship, you need to have a brother. The Bible says that iron sharpened iron. That's the relationship a lot of us have in life. And you learn from this individual, that individual learns from you. It's a good, um, it's a good place of, um, uh, of, of accountability. It's good to have somebody that's like, man, Harry, you know you're tripping, right? Like this guy, that I, I, and I tease him all the time, man. It's, um, he like, man, I, that's the kind of friend I need. Man, come on, dude. He he not going to tell me what I want to hear. I know he's going to be like, man, you tripping. You tripping. All of us need those relationships. And then the last one is we need to have a relationship that we always reaching down to pull up. It's about mentoring. It's about helping somebody. We all need to be in those relationships. So with saying that, if we're not careful, there are certain behaviors. There are learned behaviors, right? And then there are some behaviors that you can attach yourself to. And I'll use the example in our transition to brotherhood. Keith, you might not even remember this, but this is how powerful it is. I like, this is kind of how God speaks to me. So we're home. We're working on our event. This is the first year we do the Hope Symposium. So, man, he's home. Man, he's in the streets. We're hitting the streets. We're getting the word out. We're going all over town, man. It's a, it's a good day. And he says to me, say, hey, man, why are you pulling your parking brake up? Why, why, why are you pulling your parking brake up? When he said it, something clicked in me. I'm like, dang, why am I pulling my parking brake up? When I talk about learned behaviors, I drive for a living. And what I do for a living, it's important for me to pull that parking brake up. Because I've been in some trucks that have rolled when it was in park. So it's a safety measure, right? When you've been through trauma or you've been through near-death experiences, there's learned behavior that we do that we're not even aware of. If he never would have said to me, even to this day, I will still be pulling a parking brake up in my car. Why? I'm imitating a behavior that's necessary in one part of life, but in the other part, doesn't have anything to do with it. And so many men are going through life from learned behaviors and near death or near uh, losing experiences. And we and we go through life. I, I can't talk handicap and gap and golf. I'll let you guys do that. But I do know what it's like to play basketball handicap. Right. What does that mean? In college, we never study film on the team, never. 
coach, when we play a team, we go in the gym, we warm up. Our coach, he would sit on the bench and he would just look at the other team's players. And he'd be like, okay, okay. When we finish warming up, we come back to the bench. He would give us our assignments. He said, hey, when you're in the game, he cannot go left. He got a handicap. And if he go left, I'm going to take you out. As men, we have to study the handicaps of life. One of the ways we study it is through this thing God has given us called brotherhoods. Now, there, there's one brotherhood that we know, or I won't say everybody, I'll speak for myself. There was one brotherhood that I was very fond of, right? And it was on the, it was on the wrong side of tracks where we talked about things that were not edifying. And I won't go into detail, just use your imagination. We spent a lot of time talking about those things, where the spots at, who they were, how we were going. Yeah. But you'll take those same men. And when it comes to them being just better, being better men, better husbands, better fathers, better whatever it is you want to be. Why is it such a deficit in us being accountable to each other, whether we're family, friends, it's an issue, especially in our community, that it, it, it has limited us. It has made us weak. It has made us inferior. And I'm telling you, I don't care who you are watching. If we don't correct it, I'm telling you, it's a self-infliction on us. I'm, it's a self-infliction on us. So I want to have, I really want, I'm, I'm excited about this part of the podcast. So whoever wants to dive in and give some commentary on that or their own commentary as it relates to how can we be bro better brothers and hold each other accountable, whether we're friends, family, business partners, whatever the case may be, whoever wants to go chime in. I'll chime in on the whole brotherhood thing. Um, it's, it's interesting that you bring it up in, in that context because um, I have several different relationships and they fall under that brotherhood uh, umbrella. Um, I'll take, for instance, I have one, I have some neighbors that live in my neighborhood. Okay. And the relationship with those guys is so important to me because in my mind, and I know this is the reality, they're way more educated um, than I am. Um, we live a parallel life as far as finance and socially. Um, but I see those guys as, as men that I love being around that makes me strive to, to educate myself more. So I'll read more. Um, so I fit in, in that, in that conversation when, when I'm around them and they talk business, yeah. um, one's an architect and one does corporate sales for a company where he's basically, he does architect type work. Um, and I'm not, and I work as a, um, I work on the railroad, which is totally different from what they do. Right. But they be striving to, to better myself as a man in that area. And then on the other side, I have a relationship and a very close relationship with another friend who is the guy that I reach down and grab. Mm. And I'm always on him about his surroundings. Because yeah. I feel what he does in his life is he surrounds himself with people who are way beneath him. And it causes him to feel good where he is. Instead of him reaching up, he's parallel or down. And he's not bringing those people up. I think they bring him down. I said, you got to surround yourself with more impactful people in your life. Because whether you want to admit it or not, you become the people that you're around. Yes, sir. You pick up the habits from people around you. Yes, sir. You can't follow in the mud with pigs and not get mud. It mm -hmm. just doesn't happen. And I think we have to be conscious of who we surround ourselves with. Because whether we want to admit it or not, they impact us in some mm -hmm. kind of way. And our behavior or our actions, or our thoughts. So we've got to be conscious of who we surround ourselves with. It's super, super important. And I think the younger we can teach people uh, from men and women that those things are important, I think it'll be better for them later on in life when they do understand that concept. Well, I'm not going to even touch that. Somebody chime um, in. Uh, you, talk, you talked about like iron sharpening iron. Yes, I would get that out. I don't. I can't say I. I um have like that brotherhood type of relationship with anyone, but I definitely have been in situations where like um uh, at my middle school, it was a lot of kids that did not care what they were gonna do in their life, 
or um, what they wanted to do, but it was some kids that knew what I did. They knew that I was an author, a motivational speaker, and they would come up to me and they would take the time to ask me that, um, hey, how can I do this? Or what can I do to do this? No matter if they wanted to be an artist, a rapper, a, I don't know, a basketball player, an entrepreneur, a businessman. And then also it was a lot, they were also, um, they were better than, than me at some things. And so I would ask them, how can I do this? Or can you help me with this? And you know, uh, at my high school, they also know what I do. They, there's a lot of people that come up to me and ask me, how can I do this and do this? And then they're also very smart and they teach me like um, how to do certain things as well. So I definitely have had some times where I've helped somebody out and they've also helped me. And um, eventually we both end up winning and be, becoming better at what we want to do. So mm. um, I mean, that's all that's I can say. That's it. That's it. That's it. That, that's it, Bailey. You, you just, you nailed it. You nailed it. 